Buenas curiosidad científica, bienvenidos sean todos a otro episodio de curiosidad Con ustedes la habla su host Agustín Valenzuela, trayendo las maravillas del universo Y el día de hoy eh, tenemos un episodio que grabé hace varios años atrás Pero es un episodio que me encantaría que la gente retomara Porque quiero reunirme con otra persona a hablar de lo que ha sucedido con, ¿verdad? con esta, este entanglement ¿verdad? de la gente que ganó el premio Nobel y hablar de más o menos para entender cómo funcionan las partículas y la física cuántica así que aquí les dejo un episodio que grabé con Daniel Whiteson que pienso que es muy importante para poder entender cómo funcionan o verdad o lo que se entiende cuando hablamos de partículas cuando hablamos de puntos o cuando hablamos de, de verdad de, de olas ondas eh, verdad en partículas así que aquí lo tienen corillo como dice Marie Curie, en la vida no existe nada que temer, solo cosas que comprender. Solo cosas que comprender. Recuerden, Curie, buscar la manera de aprender que más le divierta. Andy Graf Tyson dice, nadie que es curioso es tonto. Las personas que no hacen preguntas permanecen ignorantes del resto de su vida. Y para ustedes, esto es curiosidad científica. de curiosidad científica con ustedes el día de hoy tengo de invitado a Daniel Whiteson eh, vamos a hablar con él sobre muchita, muchas cosas pero sobre todo sobre el, lo que más quiero saber es sobre las partículas so Daniel Whiteson con nosotros with us uh, Daniel how are you doing today I am good I am good I hope all your listeners out there are safe and healthy yes yes for sure um, What, that's that's one crazy thing like uh i believe like in these situations like people should you know it, it's kind of hard but at the same time sometimes you don't really have time to read something or to explore another things and sometimes this is not really a, as bad as you know could be you know sometimes it can give you a little bit more to your imagination or your things that you you know left behind at some time ago but anyway daniel What's going on with you? Tell us a little bit about you. Um, well, I'm a particle physicist at UC Irvine, and I smash particles together to try to figure out what is the universe made out of and what is dark matter and how does everything work. Um, I see the universe as a crazy sort of bonkers puzzle that we need to solve, and we're trying to figure it out one piece at a time. And uh, we are here during lockdown. Everybody's working from home. But as you say, it's a good time to be thinking about things deeply. And so I think we can both sort of turn in and think about what's in our minds, the questions we have, and also turn out and think about what's out there in the universe. Okay, that's great. Uh, let's start with that. Let's start with smashing stuff together. Because uh, in your book, especially, uh, you, you, you start your book talking about the building blocks. And... Can you explain a little bit? Because before we used to think like it was fire, water, uh, 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 dirt, uh, and whatever, air. And then after that, things move a little forward. And then it's like, okay, we have a periodic table. What is going on after that periodic table? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I had a lot of fun. I wrote this book with my friend Jorge Chan. And the book is called We Have No Idea. And the main message of the book is that science doesn't have everything figured out. I think because we have made a lot of progress in understanding the universe, people might think, oh, science has most everything understood and there are just a few details left to figure out. And the point of the book is that the exact opposite is true, that we're just beginning to understand what things are made out of. And so, as you said, we started thousands of years ago, people trying to figure out like, What is the stuff around me made out of these rocks and these bushes and these people and this sky? And like, is there a way to sort of unify it, to understand all of it in terms of something simpler? And that's a crazy idea, even to imagine that the different things you see around you could be made out of smaller, simpler things. And, you know, the first ideas people had, air, fire, water, those are 
now we it seems like simple silly ideas but it's really a profound concept to say i can explain all the complications around me in terms of a simpler set of objects it's a it's a really deep idea and we don't know why it works you know fast forward a few hundred years or a few thousand years and we have like the periodic table as you said which from which we can explain anything right and this is scientific it's not just like speculation like the greeks this is real science right you can make anything you've ever eaten can be made out of a hundred basic building blocks anything i've ever eaten anything any human has ever touched or seen or thrown at each other made out of the same hundred building blocks and it's sort of crazy to imagine that that's that's the case that the universe sort of works that way and now we've we've we dove further into the atom, of course, to understand what it's made out of. And we have a proton and a neutron in the nucleus surrounded by electrons. And inside the proton and neutron, we have quarks, up quarks and down quarks, which are these funny little particles. But the, the end of the story right now is that we have up quarks and down quarks to make protons and neutrons, and then around them electrons. And that means that you just need three particles, up quarks, down quarks, and electrons, to make any atom, to make anything, which means anything is made out of the same particles, right? Me and you and hamsters and lava and stars and chocolate, <laughs> right? They all have the same recipe of quarks, down quarks, electrons, and in the same number, right? Like I'm made of yeah. the same number of up quarks, down quarks, and electrons as you are. The only thing that is different from me and you is how those little pieces are put together. It's like Legos, right? A Lego dinosaur is the same as a Lego spaceship. It's the same pieces, just arranged differently. It's incredible what we've learned about our universe just from trying to take it apart. Wow, man, that's that's what blows my mind too. Like, pretty much everything is made out of three stuff, and there is a bunch of particles. Like uh, all the time we're talking about, like the uh, muon, tau, and whatever these other particles, but in a sense, like like especially those ones, like let's talk about muon and tau. They're pretty much an electron, but they are heavier. Why why is that? What's the difference? Yeah, great question. I wish I knew the answer to that question. <laughs> um, but you're right. It's on one hand we can explain everything we're made out of in terms of these three particles, but then there are other particles, right? I mean, me and you and chocolate cake, we're made out of these two quarks and electrons. But sometimes in special situations, you find these other weird particles that are not made of up quarks, down quarks, and electrons. They are their own weird fundamental particles. And about 70 years ago, people thought, oh, we're mostly understanding things. We got the proton, the neutron, the electron. We got to figure it out. And then somebody found the muon, and we were like, what? Who ordered the muon? We don't need that craziness. So we mostly were figuring things out. Don't confuse us. <laughs> And it doesn't make any sense. Like, why is the muon? Like, that's a basic question nobody knows the answer to. Like, the electron and the muon are identical. They have the same spin, the same charge. They interact almost the same way. The only difference is the muon is heavier by a lot. So why does the electron have this heavier version of itself? Pfft, we have no understanding. And then there's this another one. The tau is an even heavier version of the muon. Why does that exist? We don't know, but what we do know is that it's a clue, right? When you look at the periodic table, for example, you see patterns. And you know that those patterns tell you something. They're clues to how to get down to like a deeper layer of reality, how to like peel back the mystery and discover the truth. And now, of course, we know that all the structure of the periodic table is, in fact, telling us about how electrons fill their orbital shells, and that makes something metallic or not or whatever. In the same way, we look for patterns in our current particles, and we think that those are clues that tell us how things are organized underneath. For example, maybe electrons, muons, and taus are not tiny little point particles. Maybe they're actually made of even smaller particles, and you just arrange them in different ways to get electron, muon, and tau. And in 100 years, people will look back and be like, man, that was so obvious. <laughs> how mm -hmm. couldn't they couldn't mm -hmm. see it, right? And so I think that these are clues to basically future Nobel Prize winning discoveries we just haven't made yet. And these questions are tantalizing. And that's frankly why we wrote this book, because there are so many of these really, really basic questions nobody knows the answer to yeah. that I think are, you know, the like the, the hanging thread that's going to lead to an incredible discovery. 
Yeah, sometimes I try to like fantasize that I'm a physicist. <laughs> 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 and I think about that like maybe maybe you know like maybe the muon is just like a this it just carry more energy but for some reason too I kind of know that big particles they're no kind of welcome in the universe they decay really fast and I don't know if it's like maybe you know out of a big explosion or let's say like, like solar wind and that gets into our atmosphere and just blow a, a lot of that energy and then suddenly we have muons but it's just like way too much energy together and then they disperse and create the actual particles is is it kind of like that actually like like have you guys think about that maybe it's like well yeah they're not just like a different thing it's just like like you know like a, a i don't know let's say like a photons you right like like you have a, a this beam of light this particle this photon but it is a photon it doesn't change it's just like one of the uh it's light Mm -hmm. but then you have different ranges of those photons mm -hmm. like like you know gamma ray x-ray mm -hmm. whatever you know that you have that that whole uh thing could could that be it could that be like well we have just like an electron the difference is that that one have way too much energy that the universe cannot handle and then split it apart into an ele electron and, and couple neutrinos isn't it isn't it like that <laughs> you know i don't think you have to pretend that you're a physicist you are a physicist i mean you are thinking about the universe and coming up with ideas and asking questions, that's all being a physicist is. I, I like to think that we're all sort of physicists. If you have any interest in like understanding the universe and you can ask these kind of questions, then you're definitely a physicist. So the Thank short you. answer to your question is, we don't know um, what the relationship is. And um, we see that muons are created when you do have more energy. You're right, they're heavier and they tend to decay into electrons. They don't last very long. Like they don't, you can't have a pile of muons. You, mm -hmm. They last for microseconds, and then they turn into electrons and a bunch of neutrinos. And you're right, so heavy things don't last very long. It's like the universe likes to relax from heavy things down to light things. It like goes, to, goes down the ladder. Now, now, is there a relationship between muons and electrons that's similar to like the relationship between X-rays, gamma rays, and other photons? It's a really cool idea. Um, so far, we haven't seen a pattern, and we look at the masses, like the electron mass, the muon mass, and the tau mass, and those are three numbers, but there's no, not like there's an equal spacing. It's not like the pattern makes sense. And the other thing is we have more clues, like the other particles we talked about, the up quark and the down quark, each of those also has two heavy cousins. So like the electron has two heavy cousins, so does the up quark. They're called the charm and the top quarks. The down mm -hmm. quark has two heavy cousins. So you might immediately think, oh, okay, let's look at the pattern of the masses and see if it's the same relationship, right, in the electrons as it is in the ups, quarks, and the down quarks. But it's not. It's like totally different. There's no pattern there that we can see. So it would be great if there was some structure, right? If it was like each one was twice the next one, which was then twice the next one, or a power of three or something. But there's no pattern there we can discern. And we think we know how these particles get mass, like... Maybe you've heard of the Higgs boson. We can talk about that a little bit. They get their mass from the Higgs boson, but we don't know why some of them get a lot and some of them get a little. So it's a huge mm. unanswered question. Like we just look at this table of numbers and we have no clue why these numbers are what they are. We think there must be a reason, right? You mm -hmm. don't like to look at the universe and say, it's just random numbers. There's almost yeah. always a reason, right? The physicist in you wants to know why. We just <laughs> don't. We just don't know. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's another part. Let's about let's talk about quarks, because to me those are like the craziest particles. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, because we kind of we kind of you know understand how particles kind of get their energy, kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, or at least we have some theories about that. But what about quarks? Like uh, these guys cannot be by themselves, apparently, and out of nowhere, if you try to pull them apart as much as you can then suddenly out of nowhere like like a cell is multiplying or something they just create a, a partner how does that work it's insane yeah quarks are really weird little particles and um, quarks are different from electrons in that they feel another force like of the forces in nature there's gravity and everything that has mass feels gravity there's electromagnetism 
and everything that has electric charge, positive or negative, will feel that force. Then there's the weak nuclear force, which we can talk about later. And then there's the strong nuclear force. And this is the one that like holds the nucleus together. It's the reason why protons don't push each other away, right? Why does the nucleus not blow up? It's all positive charged protons and some neutrons. Why don't they push each other apart? The answer is the strong force. The strong force, mm -hmm. super duper strong, like really well named, much more powerful than electromagnetism. And it's also what's holding the proton together. Not only does it hold the protons, the different protons together into a nucleus, it makes one proton into a particle. And a proton is three quarks all tied together. And But the weirdest, the absolute weirdest thing about the strong force is that it's not like electromagnetism that has two charges, like a plus and a minus. It has three, right? Hmm. And you might be like, oh, what plus, minus, and what else, right? What, what else, yeah. You sort of bend your mind and have an axis with three directions on it. And so because that's like, doesn't work very well mathematically, instead we think of it artistically. So we think of them as colors. Hmm. So there's a red direction, a blue direction, and a green direction. And in order to get something to add up to have no force, like the equivalent of zero electric charge, you have to add up one red, one green, and one blue. That adds up to white, which is no effective charge. So you can get this triplet of quarks, like every proton in your body has three quarks in it. One is red, one is green, one is blue. And that's why they, <clears throat> they're neutral. They don't have any uh, um, leftover strong force, but they're tied together really, really powerfully. Um, and the other strange thing about the strong force, other than having three charges instead of two, is just as you said, it doesn't let the quarks be by themselves. It's so powerful, um, but as you pull the quarks apart, it actually gets more powerful. Like electromagnetism, if you have two charges, as you pull them apart, it gets weaker, like gravity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like you can feel the Earth's gravity pretty strongly, but you're not really feeling Jupiter's gravity or stars really far away really, really powerfully. There is some gravity there, but you don't really feel it. The strong force is the opposite. As you get further away, it gets more powerful, which means, which is crazy, right? And it means that if you try to pull two quarks apart, you're creating a lot of energy in that bond. As they get further and further apart, there's an enormous amount of energy. And the universe doesn't like to have that much just like energy flowing in that system. And so it creates new quarks between them, in, or it turns that energy into matter. And it creates new quarks to balance it out. It's like it's like tension in the universe, and it wants to relax it by canceling out those charges. Wow! So pretty much, quarks do really need a, a, a like a balance, and they will create their own balance if you try to take them apart. That's pretty much what it is. Um, yeah, because that's... the strong force is like the opposite of everything you're familiar with. It's just another example of how things at the particle level follow different rules. You know, the rules that you thought or deep and true about the universe um, can sometimes just be like thrown away when it comes down to the particle level. And the, the rules are just different and you have to get used to it and, and accept the fact that our experience here is not typical or representative, you know, and that if you really want to understand the universe, you have to sort of let go of a lot of ideas you thought were real and true and accept something totally new. But that's also sort of wonderful. It is beautiful. <laughs> Every time I, I read about this, uh, it, it's just that you kind of need a little level of understanding so you don't lose your mind when you're reading or, or talking about these things. Because <laughs> at, at some point, yes, <laughs> at some point you understand and it kind of makes sense. And it's kind of, oh, yeah, that's kind of obvious. But at the beginning, when you start reading, it's like, what? what? Because since we're talking about the nucleus right now, like the strong force pretty much what keep that nu nucleus uh, together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing that I don't understand too well is like the weak force. What is actually like the WC bosons? Like I know they were kind of like a decay of the of the particles or, or something like that, decay of the nucleus, but I don't, I don't really understand that part in there. Yeah, the weak nuclear force is amazing because it turns out that it's actually part of electromagnetism. Like the weak nuclear force we sometimes used to think of as its own force, but it's actually part of electromagnetism. It's part of a larger force we call electroweak. And mm -hmm. just the same way we used to think that electricity and magnetism were totally separate, like 150 years ago, people saw sparks, like, oh, that's electricity. And then people saw magnets, so like, that's magnetism. And then people figured out, oh, they're connected. Look, 
Electricity can create magnetism. Magnetism can create electricity. These things we thought were separate are actually two sides of the same thing. It's like if you'd only seen the front of an elephant and somebody else had only seen the tail of an elephant and you're talking to each other about it and then you discover, oh, wait a second, these are connected, literally. We made that realization about electromagnetism, you know, in the late 1800s, and it's a beautiful insight, right? It shows you how to simplify your understanding of the universe, which is the goal, right? We always want uh -huh. to take, here's all the things we've observed, let's describe them in the simplest way possible. Well, in the 60s, 1960s, somebody realized you can do the same thing, connect the weak nuclear force with electromagnetism. It turns out those are just two sides of an even bigger coin. And the W bosons and the Z bosons are just like the photon, except for some weird reason, they got a lot of mass. So the photon is massless. It travels at the speed of light. It can go through the whole universe without stopping. The Z boson is just like the photon, except it has a lot of mass. It's very heavy. And that's why it's weak, because it can hardly go very far. It lasts a really short amount of time, and then it decays. And so sometime in the very early universe, these particles got mass. In the very early universe, the weak force was not weak. It was just as strong as electromagnetism. And then this symmetry between them broke. And the Higgs boson gave mass to the W and Z bosons, making them very, very weak. This sounds like a biblical story, right? You know, and it chose its favorite children or something. Anyway, <laughs> we gave those particles mass and made them very weak, and the photon stayed massless. And it turns out that they're just, there are four particles in the electroweak force. The photon, the Z, and the two W particles. One of them happens to be massless, and the other three are not. It's an amazing story. Mm, okay, so it's kind of... It's, uh, if I understand well, it's kind of like uh, what we talked before. Like for some reason, universe don't like heavy particles, so start yeah. like kind of decaying. And, oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, why it's very short lived. Like you can't feel the weak force unless you're very, very close to something else which feels the weak force. And you know, the consequences are huge. Like there are these particles, neutrinos, which are really weird little particles. And they're weird not because they're rare, they're everywhere, but we can hardly feel them because the only force they feel is the weak force. They don't feel electromagnetism, they don't feel the strong force, they only feel the weak force. And if you hold out your finger, a hundred billion neutrinos from the sun pass through your finger every second. So you should be glad that you can't feel them because otherwise they would like shred you and give you cancer. Destroy you. Right? So and destroy you, yes. <laughs> and the reason they can't feel you is because the only way they can interact with you is through this weak nuclear force, which is super duper weak. And a neutrino, it can go through like one light year of lead without even noticing. It passes right oh through you. Yeah. And it's not oh because it's small, right? This is not about like avoiding like it's not like about slipping between atoms these atoms just don't talk to each other it's like you know two people today walking on a path and social distancing right they just try not to get near each other they just pass right through each other as if they're not even there um, and so, so there's, there's this other view of the universe like where there's all this stuff happening that you cannot see right there's neutrinos streaming through us all the time everywhere and you can't even see them so it should be any any type type of quantum field that works with like for example that neutrinos that we know about uh, at all the only field that can talk to the neutrinos is the weak nuclear force yeah so the field of the it. w and the z and that's it as far as we know um, mm. so it's pretty weird and the sun makes a lot of these because you make neutrinos when you do fusion and a mm. lot of the energy of the sun actually comes out in neutrinos and so if we could like capture the energy of neutrinos, it would solve all of our energy problems. There's like energy oh. all around us. You know, if we could only capture it somehow, then we would have as much energy as we ever needed. But it's it's inaccessible to us. You know, it just flies right through. Well, all right, then let's talk about that part. Because uh, every time you, well, in my case, I try to understand, because I was even reading the uh, Sean Carroll uh, last book, uh, called something deeply hidden. Mm -hmm. I'm almost over with it. Um, at some point, he's talking about the quantum fields. And in the quantum fields, where he's talking about like a everitarian kind of uh, theory. And at some point, you kind of realize like, okay, there's not actually particles, particles. They're supposed to be like some kind of uh, uh, reaction or interaction, like wave 
growing out of that mm-hmm. feel. But mm-hmm. still, we understand and it works when we use particles to explain stuff. But at the same time, um, what are actually, you know, like, can we just use both of them and they will both work? <laughs> or actually particles are points in space or they're just reactions in that field? It's a totally great question. Like, what's actually going on, right? What is really happening down there? The short answer is that these things are not particles. They're not points in space. They're not waves. They're not wiggles in quantum fields. They're something totally new and weird. And in some cases, some of these ideas work. They help us think about these things. They help us do calculations to predict what they will do. But none of them describe completely what's happening. Because what's happening is something that's totally alien to our experience. It's different from anything you've ever seen or experienced, right? Think about sort of philosophically, what are we doing with physics? We're trying to Mm -hmm. understand the unknown, but we can only understand it in terms of the known, right? It's like if I give you a new flavor of ice cream, you'd be like, hmm, it's kind of like chocolate. It's a little bit like coffee, maybe with a hint of, you know, whatever, cherry. You're expressing in terms of the things you know, right? Which is all you can do. You can't describe a new flavor in terms of like what, right? So we discover these new weird objects, photons and other little things. What are they? Well, sometimes talking about them like a particle makes sense. It's flying through empty space, like you would imagine a ball would if you threw it. Sometimes talking about them like waves uh, from quantum, um, quantum wave functions makes sense. Like they interfere with each other, right? Particles can't do that. Sometimes talking about them as wiggles in a quantum field makes sense because things get created and destroyed and it makes more sense to talk about them as like, you know, energy oscillating in a field rather than a particle disappearing, which is sort of weird. So sometimes one picture makes sense. Sometimes another picture makes sense. None of it is real. None of it is true. That's why I'm desperate to meet um, alien physicists. Because alien physicists will have other (laughs) totally crazy ideas for what's going on down there. And when we first hear them, we'll go like, what? That makes no sense at all. And then eventually we'll be like, oh, I see. You're thinking about it this way. Hmm, I never thought about that. That's actually kind of a deep insight. And then maybe together, somehow, we'll sort of triangulate what's going on down there. But in the end, I don't know if we ever can really know because... The quantum realm is just different, you know? It's just different from anything we can understand. So I'm not sure our brains are capable of really experiencing it in, in, a, in a way that, that you can experience your life and your and love and the things that you grew up understanding. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 there is like a lot of theories, and most of them make a lot of sense, but we can keep going down and down and down all the way to, la- like, you know, like strings, and it's even deeper there, and we probably would, would have so much more questions. And but, even uh, if we had that theory, like let's say we had string theory, and it worked, mm-hmm. and we could calculate yeah. stuff, does that mean that there really are strings? Like strings yeah. are there doing that vibration? Or does that just mean this is a way we can think about it that lets us do calculations that predict experiments? That's a philosophy question, right? It's like, is the universe actually out there, and... Are my models real or are they just things I calculate? And I don't know the answer to that. That's the kind of thing you need to smoke a lot of banana peels and then think about. (laughs) That's great. All right, let's get into one thing that I'm really excited about it. I know you have work in the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. How does that work? (laughs) You take a really big rubber band and you put a proton (laughs) in it. No, um, it's a lot of fun. (laughs) I feel really lucky to get to work at the Large Hadron Collider. When I go there, I feel like I'm in a science fiction movie. I mean, we have these these devices that are like huge cubes of electronics that are like four stories high. And the way that people talk about things and accelerating particles to the speed of light, it feels like science fiction, but it's real. And it amazes me what humanity can do. It's like you see a beautiful bridge, like the Golden Gate Bridge, and you're like, wow, look what people can do that's so much more than one person. No one person could have built that bridge, but together we've accomplished something incredible. That's how I feel about the Large Hadron Collider, like, wow, look what humanity can do. And um, the way it works is that we smash particles together, 
And that means that we take a bunch of particles. The, the biggest misconception is that we're smashing individual particles. That we're like, mm -hmm. okay, Bob the photon and Sally the photon, the proton, get in the collider. We're going to smash you together. It's your turn. That doesn't work because the particles are so small that mm -hmm. they basically never hate each other, right? Even if like you and your friend shot guns at each other, not recommended, what are the chances <laughs> that the bullets would hit, right? None. You just shoot each other. So these protons are much, much, much smaller. So the chances of them hitting is very small. So instead what we do is we get a little gas of protons, like 10 to the 12, like a you know trillion protons. And we shoot it at another trillion protons going the other way. And they pass through each other. And a few of them sometimes interact. Sometimes they pass through, you get no interactions. Sometimes you get 10 interactions. Sometimes you get one or two. And we start off with just hydrogen. And we heat it up so the electron leaves and we have protons. And then we give those a little push using um, electricity, right? Um, and then we just give it a bigger push and a bigger push and a bigger push. And we actually have a series of these accelerators, like smaller and then bigger and bigger and bigger. Until finally they're going fast enough to get injected into the actual big one, the Large Hadron Collider. And you have to be going the right speed. You can't just put um, cold protons in there because there's a connection between the size of the machine and the strength of the magnets. Like a proton will zoom along in a straight line. If you want it to go in a circle, you're going to bend it with a magnet. But then you have to get the magnet strength just right so the proton doesn't like run into the wall. Right? So you have to be going at the right speed and have the magnet mm -hmm. strength just right. So you, you put them in there and they're swimming around and there's actually two of these and they're going opposite directions. Mm. And then okay. at a certain place around the ring, they collide the beams and they, whoosh, they pass through each other. And around that place, we've surrounded with a bunch of electronics, basically a big digital camera to take a picture of this collision. And, uh, and that's the basics of how it works. And if you're interested, I can tell you about how the detectors work and, and how we see it. Wow, 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 wow. Let me ask you, is it, uh, you know, with like the uh, Higgs boson, we kind of knew that it kind of exists and we were trying to find it. Is it any other uh, particle that we have in any other theory or any hypothesis that we're like, okay, if we find other than the uh, uh, graviton, mm -hmm. is there another particle that you guys are, are working right now? Like, okay, to actually make this hypothesis work, we probably need to find this other particle. Is mm -hmm. it any mm -hmm. other new particles you guys are looking for? Well, the one that I'm specifically looking for is dark matter. Like, we know that dark mm. matter is real. We know it's out there. We know it's stuff. We know it feels gravity. That's about it. And one of the deepest questions is, like, what is it made out of? I'm made out of quarks and electrons. So are you. Is dark matter made out of another kind of particle? We know dark matter is not made out of quarks and electrons. Is it made out of some new particle we've never seen before? Is it made out of 10 different kinds of particles we've never seen before? So... One way to try to study that is to make dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider. We smash protons together, and we hope that sometimes, one every million, one every billion, one every trillion collisions, we might create dark matter. And then we'd actually have some in the lab, and we could study it. So my, my research group is trying to create dark matter and figure out what it is. Like, is it a particle? Is it something else? We don't even know. But that's something interesting because uh, we know uh, dark matter doesn't interact, at least with the electric uh, uh, electromagnetic force and things like that. So uh, we know it feels gravity or, or at least it kind of works with gravity because there is stuff, mm -hmm. you know, moving around that and it helps in the in the corners of the galaxies that the stars and galaxies don't fly away. Mm -hmm. So we know it's a certain, you know, it, it does feel gravity. But how do we, how are we going to know if, you guys actually create dark matter because we, we cannot see it at all. Or it doesn't interact with electromagnetic force. How, how You're totally right. We could create dark matter in the lab, and then how would we know if we have? You're right. We can't take a picture of it. We can't see it in the usual way. But we can tell sometimes when we've made something invisible. And here's how. is that we smash particles together, and they're sort of moving along a line. So there's like a line the beam follows. And stuff flies out sideways, right? And because of conservation momentum, we know that the stuff that flies out to the left has to balance the stuff that flies out to the right. 
because in, in the initial collision, there was no motion to the left or the right. It was just along the beam line. So if we make something invisible, then what we see is that we see stuff flying out on one side and nothing flying out on the other side. And we think, oh, well, there must have been something there because we believe in conservation of momentum. So, you know, if something, was, if something is imbalanced, then we know, we suspect there was something invisible there to balance it. And we can't see it directly. We can only see it indirectly. So that's what we're doing is we're smashing particles together and we're looking for collisions that lead to an imbalance where we can't account for all the energy, where some of it must have disappeared into something invisible. And that's uh -huh. the best we can do. And it's, you uh -huh. know, if, if we can do that and we can see it, then that would be interesting. But it's not necessarily convincing. Like, if we saw that at the collider, it wouldn't be enough, I think, to claim discovery to say, look, this is dark matter. We have other ways uh -huh. we're looking for dark matter at the same time, and we'd need to see it in different experiments. Like another thing we're doing is we're, we're looking for dark matter that comes from space. We think there's dark matter everywhere. We think it's the Earth is swimming in dark matter. So we have these big experiments underground that where it's just like a huge tank of quiet particles sitting there. And we're hoping dark matter bumps into one of them and one of them wiggles. That's like a really, really hard experiment to do to watch like a one ton tank of xenon and wait for one of them to wiggle. But if yeah. that happens, then we think, oh, well, maybe that was dark matter. And if we do experiments at the collider and we see invisible particles being created at the same rate, then we can connect them. We can say, are these the same particles that you saw over there as the ones we made in the collider? So we'll try to sort of triangulate from different directions. But it's pretty tricky. And, and it might be hopeless. Like you said, dark matter feels gravity, it might not feel any other force. All of these experiments assume that dark matter has some way to interact with our normal matter. It can bump these, these little atoms in the underground tanks. It can be created from protons. We don't know if that's true. It might be that it doesn't have any, any interaction with us at all other than gravity, which would make it very difficult to discover what kind of particle it's made out of. But you know, back to your other question, what are we looking for at the Large Hadron Collider? It's a great question. And you asked, what other theories are there that you're trying to figure out? And that's a great way to start. Like, we built this collider. What particles should we look for? Cool. But think about it like, say you were landing on a new planet, right? You sent a spaceship to Mars. You might have some questions like, I'm looking for water. I'm going to look for life. But you wouldn't only look for that, right? You'd explore You'd be open to surprises. You'd be like, well, let's just look around, right? And I'd be like, oh, we didn't find water. Let's go home. Um, and so that's what we're doing at the Large Hadron Collider is we're exploring. We're saying, well, maybe we'll see dark matter. Maybe we'll see supersymmetry. Maybe we'll see something crazy and surprising. And my personal like scientific fantasy is to see something bonkers. I want to discover something like the muon where people are like, what? That doesn't make any sense at all. Come on. Because those moments when you discover something weird and crazy and unexpected, those are the moments when you blow up everything you thought you knew and you're like, okay, let's start again. We have a new big clue as to where the universe works. So that's what I'm, that's my, what I'm focusing on. Uh, we're looking for dark matter, but we're also looking for weird new stuff that we didn't anticipate. And that's the funnest part because any day you could discover something crazy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, definitely. Uh, let me ask you, do you think, like, maybe we do need, like, a bigger collider? Maybe? Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, this is my point. Like, uh, mm -hmm. people think that we're going to destroy the world with those collisions, but we have billions and billions of stars just smashing every second, and it's really, I'm pretty sure it's way stronger and we're still alive. Um, but, I mean, do you think with a bigger collider that might help like way faster particles colliding i i don't know it would definitely help uh, a bigger collider would let us see smaller things it would see, let us see heavier things uh, it would reveal another layer to the universe but it's exploration we don't know what's there it's like saying should mm -hmm. we go land on this planet well yeah it could end up just being like boring rocks or it could like have crazy life forms on it you just don't know before you go and so one thing you shouldn't do is like promise and say, well, if you give us $50 billion to build this collider, we will discover dark matter. Well, we don't know. It's research, okay? Yeah. It's research. It's not corporate profits. It's not like, 
you know, Microsoft Office where we release the next thing and we know what's going to happen. Like, um, it's research. And so the question you have to ask is, is it worth the money? And $50 billion, that's the cost of the next collider, is a lot of money. I mean, think about yeah. all the hot lunches you could buy for poor school students and and the books you could buy and the teacher salaries you could raise. And there's lots of good ways yeah. to spend $50 billion. On the other hand, they just spent a trillion dollars <laughs> saving Wall Street. And so I feel yeah. like on one hand, it's not that much money. On the other hand, it's a lot of money. So it's not really a scientific question. Definitely $50 billion would buy us knowledge about the universe, for sure. No question. Is it worth the price tag? That's a political decision. And I mean, if I were in yeah. Congress, I would vote for that. I would also vote to give $50 billion to lots of other science research. Like, mm -hmm. I don't understand why, as a country, we don't spend more on research. Like, the, our research yeah. budget is tiny compared to what we spend on everything else. And I the know. way we got here, why are we the, mo the richest country in the world? Why do we have the best tech in the world? Why do we have good education and, and all this stuff? The reason we did that is because we invested in research. All yeah. those advancements came out of basic research. It's such a great investment. Um, I don't know why we're not multiplying our research budget by a factor of 10. So <laughs> seriously, 20, right? 20. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but uh, that's the thing. I, 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 I'm I, sorry to interrupt you. But yeah, it's like definitely crazy when people see like NASA doing all this stuff. And it's crazy that people don't realize that's like, like 0.45 at the budget of the federal budget. It's not even like half percent of, you know, it's not even half percent of 1%. Yeah. And and we do a lot of things. And sometimes people believe like, yeah, but education, this and that. And yeah, that's true. But right now you wouldn't have a cell phone or GPS <laughs> or whatever if it's yeah, not because NASA yeah. work with all this stuff that make your life easier with the Wi-Fi and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there is a balance, like you say, like it is a, political uh, uh question or decision yeah. but definitely we probably help yeah i have well, we should just buy two... one less you know uh, aircraft carrier or mm -hmm. jet you mm -hmm. know and i could fund everything anyway sorry go ahead yeah <laughs> all right i have a couple more questions since you talk about uh dark matter uh what do you guys think, or, or if, if it's any theory that I haven't read about it, because pretty much everyone says, like, we don't, have, we don't know, we don't have an idea. Is it any theory or any particles that maybe we be looking into? Like, for example, gravity. According to uh, Einstein, right, the relativity um, and, and special relativity, uh, gravity is like a, 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 a silk, like a something that is physical there and you can bend and whatever. And we thought like, well, it's going to be impossible to see gravitational waves and we have to. Mm -hmm. But then when you think about like the like the sheet of, of space and then you think about, OK, but this thing is expanding, so it's creating more space and that's called dark energy. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we doing about that? Do we think it's another kind of particle or because it kind of come out of nowhere, too. I don't know. It kind of came out of nowhere. It's one of my favorite scientific discoveries because they weren't even looking for it. You know, they were trying to figure out how quickly is the universe slowing down its expansion. And then they discovered, oh, it's not slowing down at all. It's expanding faster and faster. It's speeding up. And that blew everybody's minds. And, you know, it's only like 20-something years ago that we learned about this thing which is the most powerful energy thing in the universe. It's like two-thirds of all the energy in the universe we just learned about 20 years ago. <laughs> like, how could anybody believe that we understand anything, right? So, you know, how, what are we doing about that? We are scratching our heads and coming up with ideas, and we have no good ideas so far. Like, we have some oh, ideas, uh... but none of them work kind of like at all. And that's, you know, exciting, because it means that the right idea is still out there somebody's going to think about the right idea to understand how the universe is expanding and why it's expanding. And we don't even know, like, is it expanding at the same rate as it was in the early universe? Um, we have all these measurements that don't actually even make sense with each other. So we're just getting started. We don't know, is it a force? Is it a particle? Is it just a weird manifestation of gravity? Because gravity is something we don't understand, even though Einstein's theory is beautiful and works. And as you say, describes gravitational waves. It doesn't describe things quantum mechanically. And we think the universe is quantum mechanical. So 
This could be some weird manifestation of, of a new gravity that we haven't seen before, or it could be something totally different that we don't understand. Um, and I'm looking forward to being part of helping figure that out, or even just reading about it and understanding the universe at a deeper level. It's wonderful to live in a time of mysteries, I think. Wow, that's great. That's a great answer, actually. So the last question, because uh, I think out of all the forces, gravity is the one that I love the most. And <laughs> we believe, yeah, because it's kind of a, uh, if you have like a, a book that you want to feel like, uh, uh, I mean, inspired or whatever, <laughs> would be called gravity. Because, you know, it's like the weakest force, but it's so patient and yeah. create everything. Yeah. So it's like gravity is the best. It I know, I know the people. End, right? It wins yeah. The yeah. <laughs> exactly. So coming to the part like uh, around uh, uh, the expansion of the universe mm -hmm. and kind of like if it's a weird thing of gravity and we believe like the universe is uh, 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 quantized, uh, what's going on in, if, you know, like if you can explain that, because I know we don't have a, a good theory, I know that, but uh, can you explain a little bit why we don't understand gravity inside a black hole? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, we don't understand gravity inside a black hole because we can't see inside a black hole, which we're desperate to do. And the reason it's interesting to see inside a black hole is because that's where we think our current theories of gravity fail. Like we have a theory of gravity, as you say, which describes gravity not as a force, but as like a curvature of space. Like things with mass bend space and that changes what sort of the shortest path is so that it's a curved path instead of a straight line. But we think of everything else in the universe as quantized. And so there's various different approaches to taking gravity and understanding it quantum mechanically. One is to say, well, maybe gravity is a force. And the way it works is by passing these gravitons back and forth. That's one idea. We've never seen gravitons. They might be very hard to spot. So um, it, it, that, that's one idea. But the problem is when you put that idea together and you make a quantum theory of gravity, usually it doesn't work. Like it fails when gravity gets really, really strong. When I say it fails, I mean, like you sit down and try to calculate what happens inside a black hole and it gives you nonsense. It gives you like infinite energy or infinite forces and that just can't happen. So what we'd like to do is see what's going on inside a black hole. So we can say, okay, that's what we have to get our theory to predict. So we know sort of like what the target is, like what's going on. Because right now, um, our theory works perfectly. Like general relativity works perfectly everywhere in space. But we think it fails inside a black hole. Like inside a black hole, general relativity says that there's a point of infinite density, right? A singularity that creates a black hole. Quantum mechanics says that's impossible. That you can't localize a point of space so well to know exactly where it is and how much energy it has. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. So these two theories disagree about what's happening inside a black hole, but the secret, the answer is held behind a curtain, right? We can't see it. Mm -hmm. So that's very frustrating. There's a whole other different approach that says, don't try to turn gravity into a quantum theory. Instead, turn space into a quantum theory. Like not the, not the forces moving through it, but the space itself. Think of space as made of pixels, right? Like space is not an infinitely smooth thing where you can be here or there and any place in between. Think of it like there's pixels on your screen. There's only a certain number of places you can be. And so instead of quantizing gravity as a force, we quantize space itself. And that's called loop quantum gravity. Crazy ideas. Also has some struggles. Not sure anybody's going to make it work. Um, but, you know, we're just at the beginning of understanding. And if aliens come and could show us how to look inside a black hole, then we could get into a glimpse of what's actually happening there. It might help us figure out what gravity is and why it's the best force in the universe. I totally agree with you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Daniel, uh, this has been a super pleasure. Thank you for your time, because uh, I I have talked with a, uh, another uh, astrophysicist, but uh, in this case, you know, I have never talked with a particle physicist. And one of the things that I love the most is especially like quantum physics, awesome. uh, quantum mechanics, because uh, even though it's a little uh, crazy when we understand these things, it's like I, I even did a video uh, showing how to make a compass, you know, to point mm -hmm. to the North Pole. So we understand that it's something in there like electrons that you push to certain side uh, and it works. But I want to, uh, uh, in all my chapters, uh, at the end of the chapter, I always bring a book 
And I know uh, I'm going to uh, uh, share one book, that is your book, <laughs> but I want you to share one book um, for all the uh, you know listeners. What is your favorite book? It could be like science fiction mm -hmm. that I know you like a lot, mm -hmm. or science or whatever book that you want to bring to our listeners tonight. Uh, well, one of my favorite books about science is a book called What is Real? It's by Adam Becker, and it does a great job of talking about this question like, are things particles? Are they waves? How do you think about them? How do you understand them? What experiments have we done to prove that this is really what's happening? Uh, it's a really hard thing to write about, and he's done a really good job. I've also met him. He's a really, really nice guy and a good speaker. So I'm very happy to support his work. So it's called What is Real by Adam Becker. And I totally recommend it to you and to all of your listeners. Thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, guys. In my side, I have a book that is one of my favorite books. Uh, it's called We Have No Idea, A Guide to the Unknown Universe. This book is from Jorge Chan and who? Daniel Whiteson. <laughs> that is with us today. Uh, I love this book because uh, it explains uh, science in a way that is, at least like for me, that I just want to learn. It explains you what we know and then why we know that bring us uh, to the questions that what we're missing to explain the rest of it. So look it up and I believe it's in, a, in, in more than one language now, right? How many sí, languages? In Espanol también. Uh, it's in 24 languages now. It just came out in Hebrew. Wow, my, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow, that's great, that's great. <laughs> Daniel, this has been a huge pleasure. Thank you, thank you for giving me your time and everything that you help out with this recording. Uh, do you have any last words to say to... Well, thank you very much. I love your enthusiasm, and I think everybody... I think the questions of the universe belong to everybody, and that some people think only scientists can think about this stuff, but I feel like... They belong to everybody, and everybody can and th should think about the big questions of the universe. That's why we're here, to love each other, to appreciate art, to have fun, and to ponder this crazy, bonkers, mystery, mysterious, beautiful universe that we live in. So thank you thank for you, thank you. everybody to use their brains and think about the universe. Yeah. Ah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's kind of uh, the point, because I know there is a lot of uh, English uh, podcasts, and there is a lot of uh, YouTube podcasts are talking about science. And there is not a lot of podcasts in Spanish. And I believe like education should be like the biggest part for humans, especially when you learn about these things, you learn like we're so small. So that kind of create a little bit of humbleness uh, on people. I, I believe that's really important. So that's all I try to do. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for having all right. me on. Thank you, Daniel. Bye bye. Bye bye. Y para ustedes, esto es curiosidad científica.